great. Hello, I want to welcome everybody today to our webinar. Uh, this is Tad Radzinski. I'm a board member of ISSP. And I'm very excited about our topic today. Uh, this webinar is uh, something that we've been planning now for quite a while. And we have uh, three amazing speakers today for our panel. And uh, we're really looking forward to getting this underway. And uh, before I get into the introductions and moving through uh, the start of the webinar, I just want to go through some of the logistics. Uh, basically, we're looking at uh, taking questions from the audience. And the questions, uh, you can basically enter those into the question pane and, and provide those as we're going through. We're going we're gonna to basically kick off the webinar and have our panelists speak. We're going to have a few questions specifically for our panelists, and then audience members can be typing in the questions all during that uh, exchange. And we will be then answering some of the audience questions at the end of the webinar. We are uh, recording this webinar, and it will be the recording will be distributed at the end to anybody that has signed up. So we're excited for that, and you'll be able to refer back to this, or if you are looking for other information, uh, you'll be able to access at uh, different times. Also, I want to let everybody know that we do have a uh, hashtag going here, hashtag ISSP Big 3. So we want to keep the discussion going, and we want to really generate some excitement around the activities with sustainability and growing this into a, a bigger call to action. So. We invite you to use your social media platforms to basically uh, provide comments or even questions through the hashtag ISSP Big 3. And we'll look forward to uh, you know, really taking this uh, beyond just a webinar today to uh, actions that uh, all of us can participate in. So I wanted to just say a little bit about ISSP. And uh, Elias, if you can advance the slide here, that'd be great. ISSP is an organization that was uh, founded uh, many years ago, and basically we have over a thousand members now, right uh, worldwide. Uh, International Society of Sustainability Professionals. Our goal is really to drive sustainability uh, and take it to the next level, providing a great resource for anybody that's in this business to share information, to share education, to have an ability to network, and uh, to definitely drive uh, global change by educating you know, people that are really interested in, in getting involved in the sustainability profession. We've created a certification for sustainability professionals, and uh, we're very proud of that. It was uh, quite a bit of work. And this webinar we're doing today is something that we offer on a routine basis. And these webinars are really a major part of our education and you know, to have uh, three amazing speakers from three incredible companies today is really the, the type of thing that we, we try to provide for our audiences and all of our members. So if you like what you hear today, we're going to encourage you to, you know, definitely join our organization. Uh, typically, we uh, charge for these. We, we basically have, if you're a member, you get these webinars for free. But if someone wanted to come in and, you know, take these webinars, we would typically have a fee. But for this webinar, we decided it was such an important topic and such a great group of panelists that we're offering this free to uh, all the people that are able to join today. So, Elias, if we go to the next slide. And, you know, we offer many member benefits. Uh, we definitely have uh, a member database. We have, like I said, the, the certification, the webinars, discounts on all types of courses. And we are really working to bring uh, cutting-edge topics like our webinar today to all of you. So with that, I want to introduce uh, our, the moderators, and then I'm going to roll into the introductions for our panelists. So like I said, I'm Tad Radzinski, and I'm an ISSP board member. I also chair the webinar committee. And if you notice after my name, it says ISSP CSP. I'm a certified sustainability professional. I've gone through the certification here, and uh, it, it really has been um, – excellent for me to, you know, advance my career. And then we also have Sarah Lewis, who I'm really excited to be uh, co-hosting this with me today. Sarah is the man managing director of the Sustainability Consortium, and she's also an ISSP, CSP. So we're going to be, uh, once we get this kicked off, we're going to be basically uh, taking the questions and uh, talking to the panelists as we move forward. So with that, I'm going to introduce our panelists. 
and then we'll get underway. So like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited here because we actually have three global companies that have really demonstrated that there is a major business value to sustainability, and they've shown that sustainability can be really excellent for business, for the planet, and for the people. And um, with that, I want to definitely welcome Erin Meason. She's the Chief Sustainability Officer at Interface, and her responsibility is to, to really drive the activities within Interface that were basically formulated 20 years ago and to take Interface to the next level with basically going from a situation of not doing, doing less harm to actually creating positive change and impacts through the Climate Take Back program, which she's going to be talking about today. Our next panelist is Rick Ridgway. He's the Vice President of Public Engagement at Patagonia. And uh, Rick's been there for uh, about 12 years, and he's responsible for developing many of the environmental and sustainability initiatives that we're also familiar with with Patagonia, and we're excited to have him on our call today as well. And, and our third presenter is going to be John Tran. And John is the uh, manager of uh, sustainable living at Unilever, and uh, John's been responsible for developing the shape and the implementation of the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. So we're excited to have all three of these panelists today and really looking forward to hearing how they're taking sustainability to the next level and driving this as a major value for business. So with that, let's get started with Aaron. Hi all. I think we might have trouble hearing Aaron. Can others hear Aaron? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, that sounds good. Great. So, okay, not sure what happened. We'll we'll just do a quick start. Um, I'm super excited to be here and joined by two companies that I have a lot of respect for that really share our approach to sustainable business. So. Both our company and our sustainability ethos really started with our founder, Ray Anderson, who saw our original product, modular carpet, carpet tiles, carpet squares, whatever you want to call them, as a really innovative solution for office environments and built interface around this idea. So fast forward 43 years, we've grown into a billion dollar company that offers other modular flooring products that's really focused on becoming the world's most valuable interior products and services company through employing a business model that looks at customers, the environment, employees, and investors as equal stakeholders. Kind of the next slide, please. So 23 years into Interface, we changed this for-profit business model by transforming the focus of the business and adding this aggressive sustainability vision to have zero environmental footprint by 2020 and to have a restorative impact. Um, next slide, please. So for over for two decades, we've taken that big vision of zero impact with a restorative effect and developed frameworks, metrics, and programs to embed this thinking into our business model. So what's represented here is how we've been pursuing the implementation of this big sustainability vision in the business. So looking at programs to reduce the impacts of our factories, our products, working with our supply chain, and also you know, working to engage and enable the people of Interface to contribute to achieving these aggressive goals. And we have a ton of metrics underneath all of these platforms that help us measure progress to be able to tell you where we are in the journey. But 
Over those two decades of work, our thinking on what it means to be a sustainable business has evolved. And as we get closer to achieving those do less harm goals and our original 2020 goal year, we started exploring how we can go beyond the idea of sustainability to do no harm and how we can focus the business to have a positive impact. So next slide, please. This thinking, this shift in what it means to be a sustainable business also coincided with us welcoming a new CEO at Interface. And our new CEO, Jay Gould, um, entered Interface and became CEO just this year. And he really led an effort at Interface last summer where we announced our next 20-year mission, Climate Take Back which is really focused on running our business in a way that reverses global warming. It's a huge statement. It's a huge idea. But we felt it was really important to name the goal that we want, to really put our business out there as going beyond the ambition of just reducing carbon dioxide to reversing and creating a mission that's really centered on removing CO2 from the atmosphere. So we plan to do that by continuing to strive for zero impact for sure, but also looking at ways in our business that we can use carbon dioxide as a resource and remove it from the atmosphere. So I'm going to end with sort of the next slide and say that we're really focused now on building that in our business for how we can do this. We're looking at how our products can remove carbon by using carbon negative materials, or how our factory locations or other buildings can become carbon sinks. And we think that this map and framework that we're building around climate take back can be helpful for other companies and institutions who have a similar ambition. So we're open to partnering and collaborating, and we're really excited about how we can build out a business that can contribute to taking on one of the largest sustainability challenges in the world faces. So I'm going to close by the intro by just saying, what a time when businesses have got to redefine what sustainability means. Given the trajectory of the planet, what's going on politically, there's a huge role for business to play in not just shaping our economic future, but the future of the world, how we're going to live on the planet itself. And it's a moment when our profession really has to dig deeper to advocate for more aggressive proposals and programs. So I'm super excited to be here to share ideas and get started on the conversation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Aaron. That was that was excellent. Now we're going to have uh, hear from Rick Ridgeway. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Ted um, and uh, Elias. The next slide, please. Uh, Patagonia is a privately held company uh, owned by. Uh, can you go back to the Previous slide, Elias. Um, thank you. Patagonia is a privately held company uh, owned by Yvonne Chouinard, our founder, and his family. And Yvonne started the business in the early 1960s, making gear for climbers and mountaineers. Uh, by the late 60s, he added uh, shirts and pants and shorts, again, made for climbers. And that part of the business was spun off in 1973. And it was only five years after Yvonne and his climbing partner, Doug Tompkins, who had founded the North Face, had made a, a trip to Patagonia, the place, to climb a, an emblematic peak there called Fitzroy, which is the high point on the skyline of our uh, logo. And that's where our name came from. Um, we, in the beginning, were climbers and skiers and surfers. You're really making gear for ourselves, and, and to a large extent, we still are. And our experiences as outdoor athletes is really the root of our uh, commitment to environmental protection. When Yvonne and I returned to Patagonia the place uh, almost exactly 20 years after that uh, trip he had made with Doug, uh, instead of complete wilderness, we found uh, the grid and street signs uh, for uh, what is now a small city called Shaltin. We have witnessed in our own lifetimes the cutting of the forest uh, there and other places in the world, the 
uh, overgrazing that's led to desertification, uh, deforestation everywhere. We've witnessed in our own lifetime uh, the glaciers that we climbed as in our youth, uh, retreating and in many cases actually completely disappearing. So when we've seen things like that, we've felt compelled to do something about it, and that's why we've committed our, our business uh, to be a tool for environmental protection. Uh, and next slide, please. And by the early 90s, we articulated that into a mission statement. Uh, and I'll walk through this uh, point by point. It begins with building the best product. Now, this is in itself uh, an environmental commitment because when any product, including ours, is used by our customers for five and 10 and 15 and even more years, the environmental footprint of that product decreases exponentially over time. But at the same time, uh, we task ourselves and our customers also expect us to make that best product. And next slide, Elias. Uh, at the same time, causing no unnecessary harm. Now, we didn't say least harm, but causing no unnecessary harm is grammatically incorrect. It's a double negative. And if you remove the two negatives, you're left with causing harm. Uh, and that was the way we viewed uh, sustainability. Uh, although uh, recently we're amending that view, as I'll tell you and explain uh, in just a moment. Uh, but we task ourselves, uh, again, to causing no unnecessary harm. And, and that commitment is in itself a um, it, it includes a tension, uh, an inevitable tension that is often there between best product and no unnecessary harm. Often, if we choose a material or a fabric uh, that causes no unnecessary harm, it sometimes uh, decreases its durability. And then we have to go into a big internal discussion about whether we land on best product or no, no unnecessary harm. And it's an ongoing uh, discussion and tension in the business that ends up being a, a very, very healthy one as well. But when we get things right, when we really harmonize and optimize those two tensions, we end up with our best seller products. And next slide, which uh, allows our business to succeed so that we can, as we task ourselves here, use it to inspire and implement solutions to uh, the environmental crisis. Uh, and these three things together really have created enormous business value for us and allowed us at the moment to focus on five main pillars of our business. And the next slide, please, Elias. Uh, and that, of course, uh, the main pillar on the upper left there is uh, our apparel uh, business. Um, you know, it's not a big company. The apparel part of our business, the biggest part by far, is still a little under a billion dollars, but um, it has allowed us to focus on uh, those other uh, four areas, uh, which really has given us uh, leadership and leverage. And it begins with that top circle of our commitment to environmental philanthropy and giving 1% of our sales back to supporting environmental protection. And that's not profit, but that's good year, bad year, rain or shine. Right off our bottom line, that 1% goes into a fund that is distributed to uh, grassroots environmental groups around the world. Uh, last year, they numbered about 820, and we're, uh, since we started the program, approaching about $100 million uh, that we've donated. And in fact, as a grant-making group, by uh, the number of, uh, of environmental groups that we support, we're, I think, we think the biggest grant, environmental grant-making uh, entity in North America. We've also, uh, in the last few years, launched an impact investing um, fund called Tin Shed Ventures. And uh, that invests in uh, startups and companies uh, that in the main are focused on sustainability innovations, uh, but also on renewable uh, energy solutions. We've also, uh, in the last uh, three or four years, launched a startup food division. Uh, and that is focused on uh, developing and promoting uh, and scaling regenerative uh, agriculture. And we're discovering, we've, we've done that because we've under, we understand that in food is the, uh, we human beings, uh, the source of humans' biggest footprint on the planet. And we feel also the area where the most solutions reside. 
Uh, that's why we're in food. Uh, the food division, uh, as all of those five pillars do, operates with the same mission uh, that you saw on the previous slide as the apparel division. And finally, uh, the fifth pillar uh, of our current focus is what we call warmware. It's a partnership with our customers to take mutual responsibility for the stuff we make and, and they wear, um, built around the four R's where we partner with uh, customers to make it as easy as possible to repair our goods, um, to resell them if they're not using them, to bring them back to us uh, and using best technologies available will recycle those products. And, and it's also most controversially um, uh, trying to encourage people to think twice about their role as consumers, about their role as in global consumption. And we are asking our customers to reduce their own footprints and not buy our stuff unless they really need it. So that is an overview of our sustainability commitments. I think it's easy to dismiss us because we are privately held and because our customers are, uh, are supporting us uh, for all these environmental commitments. And that is, of course, one of the origins of our success as a business. But we're arguing that uh, these and other sustainability commitments provide business value to uh, any company. And Elias, the next slide, I'll end by walking through a brief framework uh, to uh, share with you what our views are of that business value, uh, beginning with the first one, uh, Elias. And that's, of course, uh, that we all recognize that uh, these things can save us money. Reducing energy inputs in your operations and supply chain uh, saves money. And then second, it also uh, gives a brand reward. We we all uh, recognize that. I suspect everybody on this call uh, understands that. Uh, and also how, uh, number three, it allows all, all of us to manage risk in our supply chain. If you are managing those uh, energy inputs, if you're ma managing the toxic discharges, if you're managing the waste, uh, you're also managing the risk that resides in, in the entire value chain um, of your business. And then number four. Um, Increasingly, and this isn't not, of course, not uh, doesn't apply to Patagonia as a privately held company, but it certainly does uh, at places like uh, Unilever, where sustain where fund managers are increasingly using sustainability filters to place uh, their bets. And it's no coincidence that since Paul has been running uh, Unilever globally, uh, that the value of uh, Unilever stock has gone up 190 uh, percent since Paul Pullman's been at the helm there. And the biggest driver there is the degree to which he's being rewarded by, by fund managers who have um, increased the stock value of Unilever. And then number five, uh, increasingly, um, we are understanding how these commitments to sustainability uh, allow all of us to get ahead of regulation. If you're managing the carbon intensity of your business and you're in a region that implements a carbon tax, as more and more countries are doing, then you're going to be at a competitive advantage uh, against the companies that are not doing that. And then the next one, number six, is that uh, increasingly, as I speak at universities and colleges uh, around the world, um, I'm being told by the best and brightest coming out of the business schools and universities today, the young people, the millennials, that they're not going to work for anybody who's not committed to all these things. And uh, even if they end up having to work for a company that falls short in their view, they're going to roll up their sleeves and work to turn that place around. And it is becoming nearly consistent amongst the millennials uh, coming out of the schools today. Uh, and they're, of course, also going into uh, the markets as consumers, which is the last one. And I put that there as the last because um, I don't think it's the most important today. but. Uh, if you're uh, watching trends, then you all recognize the increasing degree to which uh, customers of consumer goods and services are voting with their wallets to support companies committed to sustainability. So I'll end it here by also suggesting that all of you on the webinar, uh, if you need a framework to argue sustainability to your colleagues within your businesses and companies to increase their commitments, um, this big seven is a good way to do it. And I uh, am, as uh, 
you know, as my uh, colleague Aaron said at Patagonia, we're more than willing to help any of you out uh, in your, uh, to realize your own commitments. Again, part of our mission is to use our business to uh, inspire the companies to uh, sustainability. So thank you again. Okay. Thank you, Rick. That was excellent. Uh, I want to introduce uh, John Tran now from Unilever. Great. Thanks, Ted, and thank you, everyone, for joining the call today. Um, I'll be quick. I promise I, I uh, really want to get into the meat of the conversation, so I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, just to kind of level set things a little about um, Unilever, we are um, about a 52 billion euro business with um, a reach of over 2.5 billion people who use our products every single day. Uh, we operate in about 100 com countries as well as selling into 190 countries worldwide. Um, and we have about 150 million households that purchase our products every single day. So uh, in terms of footprint, we have a pretty large one. And that's actually kind of one of the reasons why I want to talk to you today about our sustainable living plan. And to kind of level set things, um, one of the things that we always talk about is where will we be in the future? So we know that by 2050, there's going to be 9 billion people on the planet. We know but by 2060, there's going to be 10 billion people. So one of the questions we always ask ourselves at Unilever is, how do we live within the means of the planet that we have and within its own resources? So um, what we did was at Unilever was create our own, um, our own framework to, uh, in order to meet those challenges of the future. And we really believe that um, this framework Work is the solution in which business can succeed. Um, so in, in going into our sustainable living plan, there's really three big pillars that we um, are really focused on by, uh, by 2020. The first is really to help more than a billion people improve their health and well-being across the world. Um, we want to make sure that everyone looks good, feels good, and gets more out of the world um, today. The, the second uh, opportunity that we really want to focus on is to cut our environmental footprint in half. We are committed to uh, reduce our environmental footprint by 50%, um, uh, all the while growing our business. Um, and you know, the last goal that we really want to achieve is to source 100% of our agricultural raw materials. We are a foods and personal care business, and we want to make sure that all of the materials that we source um, not only come from sustainable sources, but also enhance the livelihoods of people across our value chain. And so when you, when you look at those kind of opportunities, we, we, we ask ourselves, what do we want to be? Who do we want to be when we grow up? And that kind of brings into our vision, which is to make sustainable living commonplace. You may ask yourself the question, you know, what does that actually mean? Well, you know, one of the things we, we um, look to achieve is that um, we want to work with our full value chain. We want to work with our suppliers, our customers, and our consumers uh, to make sure that we're all living sustainably. And, and so when we go to the next slide, um, what we are looking to do is um, really deliver value for all of our stakeholders. So uh, one of the things that we always talk about is our purpose-driven brands. You know, we, have, we are a purpose-driven business. We want to make sure that everyone lives um, uh, to make sustainable living commonplace. But you know, in order to achieve that with our, our stakeholders, we want to make sure that our brands are also living their own purpose. Um, and so, you know, at the end of the day, we are also um, a sustainable business. And in order to be a sustainable business, we need to make sure that um, our, our brands grow um, faster, and which uh, we have seen. So we know that um, in 2014, our brands grew faster, our sustainable living brands grew faster than the rest of the business. Um, They're about 30% faster. We've seen that in 2016, um, that number has increased to about 40% faster than the rest of the business. And so what we are looking through our sustainable living plan is really to achieve these goals um, all the while to make sure our business um, is continuing to, to grow and spread um, as much as possible. So that's kind of the, the high level um, uh, framework of our sustainable living plan here at Unilever. I actually, you know, um, want to kind of get into the meat of the conversation. So I'm going to kind of stop it there. There is one more slide, um, which we can uh, move on to next. But uh, one of the interesting that things that people always ask me is, uh, who is Unilever? And so I just want to kind of give you a visual aid of uh, some of the brands that we, we craft for life. Excellent. <laughs> 
Thank you very much, John. And I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Sarah to kick off our questions. Yeah, thank you, all three of you. Wonderful. And one thing that I certainly heard is is a theme is the that common thread of making sustainability just integral to your business strategy, your business model, and and also that you know your leadership is on board um, across the, across the board, and that's so important. So we have a number of questions here, and again, I'll invite others um, that have joined us today to also add your questions to the, the question area, and we will, we will also be um, pulling from those as we continue our conversation. So the first question we have for the group is um, that in the United States and, and all over the world, uh, there is just continued dispute about the value of sustainability for countries as well as companies. And companies like you are visionaries and change makers. And so what are you most optimistic about in the next five years? And and what is the role of the next generation as we try to overcome this, this kind of perpetual dispute about the value of sustainability? So what are you most optimistic about, and what do you feel like the role of the next generation is? So um, I'll, I'll take this one first. You know, um, mm -hmm. I... I yeah, you know, I'm actually really optimistic about a lot of different things, but um, it, it's kind of funny because I'm I'm actually really optimistic about the next generation, um, Sarah. So uh, we we actually know that um, you know millenn uh, early younger millennials as well as Generation Z, about 72 to 73 percent of them are willing to pay more for sustainable products, which is actually a huge increase um, from the last couple of years. So we we've known that that number has been kind of tripling up. Um, in a very positive way. So I'm actually really excited about um, the next generation of, of sustainability professionals. Um, and then you kind of ask, you know, what is the role of the next generation? Well, it's to lead us into this new, this new sustainable business world. Um, we've seen that um, the idea of sustainability, not just in business, but in society, has become mm -hmm. so much more common and accessible for people. Like if you kind of look 10 years back, one of the things that uh, a lot of people associated with sustainability was it was for the privileged few. Um, you know, you think about the cost of organic foods and, you know, the cost of non-GMO ingredients. Well, that cost has actually gone down and the number of product offerings has increased. Um, so I'm really excited to see that everyone can really live well and live within their own resources um, and it's really accessible for other people now. That's a that's a great point. I think others also are seeing that 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 there's just a more and more demand and more willingness to pay, which I think really is going to be a driver across businesses for sure. Others thoughts on on that? Sure. This is Erin. Um, I'm super optimistic about all of the negative carbon technologies that are just exploding right now. So. About a year ago, when we sort of stood up and said the next mission for Interface is really about reversing global warming, we didn't have any idea of the potential collaborators, partners, innovators, things that were happening out there in the world. And that making that statement drew some of those people to us. And over the last 12 months, we've started to see all these amazing new technologies that are focused on things like carbon negative raw materials that could mm -hmm. be made into products or building integrated technologies to remove carbon from the atmosphere. It's just an area that's really exploding and it gives me such optimism that we sort of as a planet are going to be able to tackle climate change. Yeah, and this is Rick. Uh, at our company, we generally tend to be uh, pessimistic about these long-term trends. Uh, they're so horrific that uh, we continue to, to sometimes doubt whether all of us collectively can turn this around in time uh, to avoid going over the cliff. But, you know, having said that, we still are seeing an accelerated change that is shifting our pessimism a, a little towards optimism. Uh, mm -hmm. We are recognizing, of course, that uh, we can't rely on government anymore. It's up to business and civil society, uh, especially, uh, to be the change agents. Uh, but 
but it's not uniform. There are some governments that are um, still stepping up to the plate. Just 10 days ago, I was in Chile uh, with Paul Pullman, and we had a meeting with the president um, with the goal of introducing all the leaders of their energy and extractive, uh, in, uh, and extractive industries to a new carbon tax that Chile's just passed. We had 70% of the GDP in the room. And Paul got up and just laid out the case for the business case for the business value of managing carbon. And all the faces in the room, people were getting it. And the president stood up and said, we're going to do this. We're going to help lead the world. So it's interesting to see you know, little countries like that stepping out in a vacuum, essentially, amongst the, a lot of the leading economies in the world and taking a leadership role. So there's a lot of areas where there's still um, uh, shine, where the light is shining bright and, uh, and collectively, there perhaps we can avoid that cliff. Yeah. Um, Rick, you, you make a really good point. You know, one of the things that we always talk about at Unilever is that, you know, we, we definitely do believe and agree with you that business should lead, but we also think that um, business alone cannot succeed if all others fail. So, you know, there is no, there is no success in enduring poverty. So kind of working with private business as well as uh, civil society and government, you know, there's a new social contract brewing where we all have to kind of work together. And I think kind of the, 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 really amazing amalgamation of that is really the uh, our, our very first global framework, which is the, the sustainable development goals. And so, um, you know, that's really something that's very powerful and some guideline that we can use as a framework to kind of lead into the future. Great. Okay. Well, this is, that, that was an excellent discussion. I want to thank you for that. Uh, Another question that we want to ask you is, since you're all leaders in sustainability and you both all have extensive supply chains, how do you go about bringing your suppliers into understanding that a sustainable business model is a, is a good way to go? And, and you know, how do you get them to focus on that and, and understand that they're really a, a key part of your overall sustainability strategies as companies? Well, I can start if you want. This is this is Rick. Um, you know, we believe uh, deeply in the value of equal partnership with our suppliers. Uh, that we want all of them to see us as as partners, uh, and we want to use uh, we don't want to use a stick to to beat them up. Um, and when we do discover uh, problems in the supply chain, we again try to partner with them, uh, and sometimes with other stakeholders to find. Uh, solutions. Uh, you know, that's our philosophy, and it's worked very well. And then uh, we also are um, depending on increasingly using measurement in our supply chain uh, to manage impacts. Uh, as a co-founder of the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, um, we're using the HIG tools coming out of that effort to uh, measure all of our suppliers uh, through all three tiers. And in apparel, that's cut and sew, but then the second two tiers uh, where most of the environmental impact reside uh, in the mills and dye houses. We're measuring those guys as well. And then finally, when we do partner with somebody uh, and we try to work with other stakeholders to see the change that we need, uh, if they're unwilling to do it after a fair amount of time, uh, we'll uh, move on to someone else. Well, that's great, Rick. Thank you for that input. Uh, John or Aaron, do you have any input to that question? Yeah, um, you know, at, at Unilever, we have some pretty lofty goals. We call them our, our big three, uh, um, the ones that I mentioned. So, um, you know, uh, helping improve the lives, health and well-being of a billion people, cutting our environmental footprint, and, you know, in, increasing the livelihoods of uh, the people in our communities and our supply chain. So, you know, we can't achieve these goals alone. We need partners to, to do it, and we need partners who, who share our vision. And so we've really worked really closely with, um, a lot of our partners up and down our supply chain. So we have a kind of special program or a strategic program that we have called uh, Partner to Win. It's a, it's a pretty strategic concept that really looks at our key partners in commodity areas. Um, and we, what we do is we really try to look for business value relationships. Um, you know, it, value for both sides. You know, we want to make sure that we are the customer of choice for our suppliers, but we also want suppliers who are willing to work together um, to achieve these goals. 
And so, um, you know, what we do is we develop these uh, joint business development plans to ensure that uh, any framework that we create delivers on these goals together. So we, we measure our value through uh, different models, but with four main areas. Um, you know, we, we ask ourselves the questions, um, does it help grow our businesses? Does it reduce our risks? Does it build trust with our consumers and our customers? Um, and at the end of the day, does it help us uh, create savings opportunities? Um, and if so, um, that's how we drive more, uh, more partnership with our suppliers and our supply chain. Great, John. Think, Thank you um, very you much. Know, I think this idea of partnerships and relationship is really key because there isn't a one-size-fits-all. I think some universals in terms of working with suppliers are helpful. Um, you know, things that can ground your suppliers in terms of building their awareness. Or, you know, one thing that we used to do, do in the early days and we still do a bit of is supplier summits where we focus not just on what are the company goals and what are your company goals, but what's happening in the world and how do we work together to sort of reduce impacts or bring about sort of the future that we want. So that's a tool that's been really helpful. Data in and of itself is very helpful, and I've been super excited to see kind of the proliferation now of these tools that companies can use to sort of pull in data from their supply chains and really understand what is the carbon footprint across the business? What are the carbon footprint of the raw materials? And as these, um, you know, sort of database-driven tools have become more sophisticated, some of them are even incorporating ways to sort of flag to your suppliers where they might see immediate uh, cost savings or sustainability opportunities. So, you know, there's some universals in terms of building those relationships and engaging them through sharing mission work, whether that's awareness building stuff or workshops, I think a lot more tools are coming online to really help companies understand where they can help suppliers see the value in reducing their impacts, doing something innovative. And then, you know, the third, the third area is sometimes there's just nothing that stands in for actual action. And doing an innovative pilot and working with suppliers to be able to show what's possible um, has been a really powerful tool for a company our size, which is, you know, just shy of a billion. We've got a couple of large suppliers with large impacts in our supply chain that give us raw materials. And one of the ways that we've been able to change minds with them is sometimes just showing them on a pilot basis what's possible. So Interface's Networks program, I would say, was a great example of that where we were aiming to sort of work with our supply chain to show them how do we step beyond recycled content and the reduced impact of nylon, which is one of the largest raw materials that we use in the business. How do we sort of show them what it means to recycle a raw material in a way that could have a positive social impact? So we designed a program working with the Zoological Society of London interface and ultimately one of our supply chain partners to harvest used fishing nets um, working with local communities in the Philippines and pull them into our supply chain while simultaneously providing some economic benefit to those in those communities who are working to collect the nets. So it's just a great example of showing what's possible by doing it on a really small scale and then sort of changing minds that way. And uh, Ted, this is Rick. We should give a shout out to Sarah on the call with us and her sustainability consortium, which really does have a robust uh, hotspot assessment tool to uh, point out places in the supply chain where companies can really focus their uh, sustainability investments to best effect. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. And I, I think just looking at, there are resources available. And, and some of the questions we're getting in, in the feed are, you know, asking, um, about kind of how do you get started, and, and I think that leads us well into this next question, that, and it will pull also some of the questions we're getting from the audience. Is, you know, you all, as we mentioned earlier, you have made your organizations, and with you in many ways leading that, made sustainability integral to your business model, and it's not add-on; it's it's part of your DNA, and and the question is, how have you ensured that? Your, across the board that your your teams and your colleagues 
uh, every employee is integrated into that strategy and and maybe how have you done that but then also thinking about how would that be done at some maybe a more traditional you might say I think was the word that came in traditional organization traditional company that may not have what you all have kind of you've done this for a while so maybe if they're just getting started how do you begin to get other employees on board and and build that DNA and sustainability into that DNA and maybe you have some advice for sustainability professionals and students that are just getting into this Sure. Yeah, this is Erin. So, I mean, I'll, I'll – sorry. <laughs> go ahead, Erin. Yeah, I mean, it's 23 years ago, that's where Interface was. We, we actually didn't have the luxury of starting out as a business that really understood this at the get-go. Halfway through the life of the company, we sort of made a revolutionary turn. And, you know, one of the first things that we did that I think was incredibly helpful for Interface was – we took this large vision of, you know, a zero footprint company with a restorative impact and we built a framework to apply that in our business. And we said, okay, if we're going to achieve this, what are the big areas that need to change at Interface? Where are the big places we really need to focus? You know, we need to focus on waste. We need to focus on energy. And, and that thinking, I think, is quite common now. So there are lots of great sustainability frameworks, whether you look at sort of what Rick was talking about earlier on the call or you look at Interface's seven fronts framework and you say, okay, now how do I map, how do I put together a plan in my business that's going to achieve progress on these seven fronts or these five fronts or these six fronts? Um, and then one of the first things Interface did is we started with something quite tangible because we were making – revolutionary change, not just at the executive level, not just at the product design level, but all the way down to the factory floor. So we needed to start with something quite tangible. So Interface really grabbed on to waste. And we said, we're really going to drive this in our company. We're going to focus first on reducing these impacts. Now, I would argue that that's probably table stakes nowadays. But it, it was a really great starting point for us because it was quite tangible. People could see it. Mm -hmm. And this is something you cannot just talk about numerically, but what Interface used to do is we would walk around on the factory floor and people would pick up handfuls of yarn, they mm -hmm. would glue it to a poster, and we would put the price associated with that yarn underneath. And wow. the implication was we're throwing away $57 today, we're throwing away $387. And you add that up and you continue to see that message and it made it quite tangible. So I think it's really important to sort of have a framework that takes the big vision down to some key areas that you can drive and then building in some programs and starting where it's tangible. I would say that's a start. Mm -hmm. um, this is Rick. Um, I've observed that more often than not, uh, companies have a, uh, an evolution, a common evolution in their path uh, to increasing sustainability commitments that begins with usually a leadership that uh, hears about sustain the sustainability thing and decides they need to do something about it. So they create a sustainability office and put an individual uh, as a leader who uh, in the beginning usually has very little if no power at all. And then over time, as uh, the company starts to become increasingly aware of some business value and sustainability, that person will typically get uh, a staff and increase their influence in the company. And then eventually, uh, if the company continues in its evolution, the sustainability department is uh, is embedded throughout the company. It's often, as it, as it was here several years ago, disassembled and embedded throughout the organization so that there are sustainability people in all areas of the business that are committed to uh, guiding their department's com sustainability commitments. Now, this only happens, of course, if you have a leadership committed to these things. And yeah. I put up my own framework of, uh, d of, of, of uh, my own views about what the business value is from these investments on the screen earlier in this presentation so that uh, so that those of you in companies listening to this who, who don't have leaders sufficiently committed uh, could think about the, the best ways that you could make the argument to them about the business value for this because that's what's not only going to get your uh, CEO interested in this, but perhaps arguably even more important, your, your CFO and the financial people in your business to recognize the value. 
Yeah, and I'll, I'll echo that. Um, I'll talk a little about kind of Unilever, and then I'll, I'll kind of drop you some advice on that. But, you know, Unilever, it's, you know, it's purpose-driven business, it's purpose-driven brands. But to be honest, the secret sauce to our business is our purpose-driven people. And so what we really want to do here at our organization is unlock every single employee's personal purpose. We ask um, everyone – I, I ask everyone a lot of different days, you know, what is your personal purpose? What do you stand for? What do you believe in? And, um, you know, looking at 2017 and beyond, that's one of the things that we really want to focus on is, you know, how do we unlock that personal purpose and really uh, empower every single employee to feel like they are contributing to our sustainable living plan? I'm kind of reminded by um, – um, what is it uh, – John F. Kennedy when he – you know, he went to NASA in the 1960s, and he asked this uh, NASA janitor, he said, you know, what are you doing? And the, and the janitor replied and said, well, I'm, I'm helping us get to the moon. Had no mm -hmm. mention of what his actual physical responsibility was, but, you know, it's this common purpose that we all have for something bigger, for this kind of big transformational change. And, you know, that's kind of what we want to do for our employees here. So that's how we kind of try to embed sustainability to every single role um, uh, with our organization. In terms of advice, um, you know, I have to say to everyone, be very deliberate, deliberate, be very specific, um, you know, let it be known what you want. I think uh, one of the things that can be a little disenchanting sometimes is when I ask someone, you know, what do you want to do with your career and your, your professional career? And, um, you know, one of the kind of knee-jerk responses I have sometimes is when people say, I want to change the world. Um, you know, one of the advice is be very specific because we all want to change the world. Um, but I, I echo what Rick said in that, you know, if you're looking to kind of build on your sustainability program um, or even start one, you know, identify the business value. Ask yourselves those four questions that we ask ourselves every day is uh, of does it add growth to the business? Is it reducing the risk? Um, is it increasing trust with our consumers or with our stakeholders? Um, is it help saving something for the business? Um, I think, you know, any kind of initiative will really kind of drive towards that if it really is a sustainable uh, business driver. Those, the, those are excellent responses, and this is great advice, you know, especially for all of you that have been through this. I mean, you guys have been in the trenches doing this work now, and, you know, many of our members here and the people on this webinar, I, I think that's great, great information. Uh, the one thing I would ask, we're getting a lot of questions around kind of the future. You know, what, is, what does the future look like? And, you know, people are asking questions about how does technology play into this? How does big data play into this? And uh, Aaron, specifically, uh, you know, questions about climate take back. You know, if you if you figure out a way to utilize CO2, you know, and, and basically reverse the impact of that and turn it into something positive, you know, is that something you plan to share with uh, others, or or how do you all see that the the future going with uh, you know just just what you know right now? Well, I mean, I think we're definitely moving towards wanting to move from business as being part of the planet's problem to making business part of the solution. So, you know, we want to move businesses from this idea of we're making products and trying to solve sustainability challenges on the side to we're making products, we're doing business in a way that is solving sustainability challenges. So, you know, absolutely this idea that to the extent we're able to un find and unlock things like carbon negative raw materials or we're able to sort of find a model for what it looks like at a factory location to sequester as much carbon as the local high performing ecosystem it's you know our commitment to kind of share those models so we've been in a really interesting year and a half pilot project with the biomimicry institute on how we could create a factory campus that functions like a high-performing ecosystem. We call it factory as a forest. And the, the big conversation we're having right now is how could we now create a scalable model that's shareable for any company who would want to undertake this in their business. So I think the, the future is sort of really about this idea of how do we transform not just our businesses or others so that the very act of doing business helps us get to the place that we want. And in the short term, 
I think you're very right, and, and the people on the webinar are very right to say, what is it that the businesses who are leading the way can do to shorten the learning curve, um, to create platforms for sharing, to share those models? One, one commitment we've made around Climate Take Back is to start to build out a platform where we can share information with other companies and institutions on how we're doing this, how we're finding these materials for our products, what we're doing at campuses. So I think that sharing piece is a really important part. And uh, at Patagonia, we're viewing climate change uh, through a framework of, uh, of three categories of solutions. The first is the one around uh, reducing emissions, uh, principally focused on renewables. The second is uh, the vision of increasing the amount of wilderness and protected area on the planet uh, as giant carbon sinks. And that's one of the main reasons we remain so committed to uh, wildland protection. But the third uh, giant opportunity for all of us is to scale regenerative agriculture and grazing. Uh, because those protocols, as John knows at Unilever, uh, can potentially create uh, farming methods that really uh, vast, vastly scale uh, sequester carbon, take it out of the air and put it into the ground. Uh, it's estimated that if 40 to 50 percent of existing farming and grazing converted to regenerative practices, that alone would get us back to pre-industrial carbon levels of 290 parts per million in the atmosphere. That's why Patagonia is going into food. Excellent. Thank you. John, did you want to respond? Do you have anything you want to say on behalf of Unilever? You know, Rick is kind of doing my job for me, so I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm good on that. So there's another question. I'd love to kind of answer that one. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we're getting down to the very end of our time here, and I, this has been so amazing. I wish we had another hour here because this, this has just been incredible, this discussion and the, the information you're providing to our audience and I think what we should do is let's let's advance one slide, Elias, and just talk about the the call to action because I, I do want to ask all of you, you know, this we we really would hope that to continue this awesome discussion and the, and the great information we're learning today is how can a sustainable business draw, model drive more business growth? And we want to hear this from all of you that are on the the webinar and that even the people that are going to be watching the recording of this in the future. We want to keep this going with our hashtag ISSP Big Three. And you know, before we wrap up here, I, I just wanted to ask uh, our panelists. You know, what do you think can can we do uh, to really uh, drive sustainable business and make it a model for everybody to to make more more companies like you adopt this? Well, Rick here uh, for everybody on the webinar to do everything you can as individuals to um, convince your companies to increase their commitments to sustainability uh, through your efforts and through business uh, can be one of the biggest agents for change to, again, avoid the cliff. Um, this is John here. Um, so, you know, our growth model is simple. It's powerful. Um, you know, growth is consistent. It's competitive, uh, profitable, and responsible. We've seen that through our brands. And so, you know, we need to continue to uh, educate our consumers, but also to encourage our partners and our supply chain um, players to continue to drive that messaging forward. I think it's definitely, to the extent that you're in a sustainability role now, I think we definitely are entering into this phase where we need to up our level of ambition, whether you're on a campus sustainability office, at an NGO, whether you're in a business, this shifting the thinking from how do we go from um, the old mindset of reducing impacts to sort of the new mindset of what will it take to create a positive impact, our company, our institution, our campus, um, our organization, I think that's really powerful thinking. And there are some great coalitions emerging around that, whether it's the net positive business work and how that would be defined, whether it's the handprint work, that's um, happening uh, with Greg Norris and company at Harvard, I would say take a look at those and start to change the conversation and try to up this level of ambition. It, I think it really is time for us to sort of set much more aggressive goals and targets as, as business in particular um, to kind of create the future that we want. 
That's that's excellent. Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists. This has been an amazing webinar. Like I said, I wish we had a lot more time and we could keep talking. I challenge all of you that have joined this to really keep this movement going. Uh, use the hashtag, you know, take action in your own groups, you know, people you work with, tell people, start to, you know, take action yourself, make changes. And, you know, we really are excited about this. We want to, you know, be a resource to all of you through the ISSP. So if any of you are interested in joining our organization, you can find that information right on our website. And we want to keep bringing you these amazing uh, webinars and create this great information. So, Thank you again to all our panelists, and uh, this has been really great. I really appreciate your time today, and we're very excited. And thank you. Thank you all for the work you're doing and your companies are doing. Yes, thank you. Thanks, guys.